Well, thank you for leading us our time of corporate prayer, and good morning, church. It's good to see so many that made it through the rain. I listened to the weather forecast, it said rain everywhere. I was like, oh, okay, rain everywhere in the country. So thank you for making it um, this morning. Uh, We're nice and dry in this building. So, the book of Ruth, our Redeemer offers rest. Um, For those who have just joined us today or been away on a family occasion or for a work appointment, we are up to Act chapter chapter Act four, chapter four. It's kind of hard to say. Act chapter Act chapter four, Act four, chapter four. Very good. Okay, so we've done one. I've got through that. That's now it's all downhill from now. Um, We've done chapter one with Act one, where we see a family um, of Israelites who. Uh, escape of a, a famine, they make an unwise choice and they move off to away from the promised land. And there the father and the two sons die, leaving three ladies without husbands, without children, and in a foreign land, and in that culture without a male, they left them without protection and provision. And then in Act 2, we discover rest. Uh, Naomi goes back to the promised land with her daughter-in-law, faithful daughter-in-law. And while they're there, she um, discovers a close relative, um, Boaz. And then we move to Act 3, where, um, no, uh, where Ruth is told to seek rest. And she does. She obeys. She submits to her mother-in-law and goes off and uh, talks to Boaz. And now we're in Act Chapter 4, which I've circled a big circle with a pink line right around it, so you know where we're at. And so now we're going to look at this um, part, the next part in the solution. The, the solution has been found in chapter 3, but now it's going to be unwound, and we're sort of going down the hill of the green line, and then a little bit up, and then along, and seeing what we're going to find. So we're going to discover the process in rest. So today we're going to focus on just that event in the purple line. So there you are. We know where we're at. I'm going to look at um, a couple of movements. The first movement we're going to look at is sitting at the gate, the strategic negotiation, and the giving of the sandal. And I'll spend most of my time here, so don't freak out when I start introducing other stuff. The sermon will finish eventually. So let's have a look at this first um, group of stages. Chapter, one, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down. And behold, the Redeemer, whom Boaz had spoken about, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here, And he turned aside and sat down. So here in chapter 4, we learn about the successful entrepreneur, businessman, who has been highly respected in his community. Now this is, and he goes and sits at the gate. Now this is not some ordinary back gate that you might have to your property that leads to your garden. uh, But this is the entrance of a gate to a city. And it's a very significant point. The early readers would have realized this is a place for security, but also for doing business and for legal transactions. And you can see there, they would have had uh, Roman soldiers sit in um, the courtyards. They usually had about six little pockets for them to sit in, quite big areas with seats, and to do business with. So, Boaz um, lives in a time of the judges, which we talked about last time, which is a time when people just did whatever they wanted to. If they wanted to sin, they sinned. If they wanted to do it according to their way, they would. Yet Boaz, the man who, in our story, he's a man of uprightness. He follows God's way. He has authentic faith. He follows Jesus. And we see this right throughout the book of Ruth. In chapter 2, Boaz says to his workers, The Lord be with you. And his workers say back to him, The Lord bless you. And in Ruth chapter 2, we see that Boaz is testified as a man of character, a man of God. So here in chapter 4, in Act 4, Boaz goes and sits at the gate. And waits for the first redeemer to come. So why is he waiting at the gate for this first redeemer to come? Well, in the story, in the last chapter, uh, Ruth, the young lady, uh, through the guidance of Naomi, her mother-in-law, was advised that she should seek rest. So she was guided to wash, put on ointment. So she, she put on her nice clothes and went off and found out where Boaz was and uncovered his feet and lay down on the fleshing floor and waited. And of course, Boaz uh, woke up and was startled. And that's an understatement. Imagine waking up and there's a lady at your feet. That would be pretty like, whoa, there's a lady at my feet. So he woke up and he said, who are you? And uh, they had this amazing conversation. Now, using their culture of their time and the biblical principles um, with deep symbolism, she asked two things of Boaz. Ruth 3.9, she says this. 
Spread your wings over your servant, for you are my redeemer. The first was an invitation of interest in marriage, and the second was an invitation to apply the redemption principle. So Boaz, that night, correctly pointed out to Ruth that he was her redeemer, but there was a closer redeemer that had to be approached first. Boaz informs her that he will step up to the task, um, but first he needs to go and see the other redeemer, so which we see in chapter 4. So that's why he's at the gate. Bo is sitting at this gate so he can meet the first redeemer. We're told um, not the name of this person. He could have been Boaz's older brother, a cousin, a relative, but someone close in the line. He is not named. Boaz knows him. He calls him his friend, and they sit down together. So the first reason for Boaz being at this gate, this legal place, um, was to meet the first redeemer. Now you say to yourself, what is a redeemer? We've talked about this. A redeemer is a person who is a relative of the family who has an obligation to show care to his family members. And this role is to restore somebody else in the family to full wholeness. And it's kind of a wide variety. It's a principle that you can use for many different things. It doesn't mean to be just very specific. It could mean that you might need to buy them a new cell phone or you might need to pay for their rugby tickets, whatever it might be. But generally they had some big ideas involved. One of them was this. If you were sold into slavery to the Australians, they had the right or they had the responsibility to go to Australia, find you and bring you back. If someone murdered you, you had the responsibility to find out legally and pursue them to make sure that justice was done for the family. You're also responsible for buying back the family farm if it got sold. And also of carrying on the family name by marrying the single um, widow lady who had no children. And so they had a whole bunch of responsibilities, but also generally they had things to do. So what motivated Boaz to go to the gate and meet the first redeemer? Now, obviously, at the point in the story, they loved each other. They had fallen in likeness. I don't know why they used the word falling in likeness or falling in love. It sounds bad. When you trip and you fall, it's bad. But they fell in love, which apparently is a good thing. So here they are. They are in love with each other. Um, they're attracted by each other's godliness. Uh, she is godly. Uh, he is godly. And they, they find this likeness to each other. But why would they, um, in the situation, why would he go to the gate? He's got this beautiful girl that he loves. But Boaz is careful. He's a godly man. He doesn't just do what he feels like. He consults. He thinks about his actions with God. He knows, I'm going to live my life according to God's ways. And so he has this opportunity, but he realizes this opportunity needs to be processed properly. And so that night, he tells her, I will do this. Um, but first of all, I need to go and consult somebody else. Now, it must have been uncomfortable and hard for Boaz to say those words in uh, verse 13. He says, remain here tonight, and in the morning, if he redeems you, good, let it be done. Good? If somebody else takes the girl that you like? But if he does not, willing to, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. So he didn't let the butterflies in his heart get too excited. He still followed God. He still looked out for what God was doing in him. That night, he got close to having the dream of having a wife. Uh, they declared their relationship, that they liked each other. But at the same time, he was very, very cautious. He paused and said, how can I follow God's way for my life? Imagine if that first man had said, yes, I'll marry, I'll, I'll take the land. We don't have to imagine it because it's exactly what he said. The first time through the questions, he says, yes, I'll take the land. But obviously later on, he says, no. So Boaz was taking a big risk here. By following God's ways, you take a risk because you take it out of your own hands and you put it in God's hands. Boaz could have lost the opportunity to marry here. Boaz had a heart to do what's right, and that was the most important thing. He wasn't going to go behind the other guy's back. He wasn't going to go behind God's law. He was going to follow what God had for him in his life. Now, history tells us back in those days that what? It was a dark period. People did whatever they wanted to in their own eyes. So Boaz could have easily just forgot about the laws, forgot about doing it the proper way, and just did what he wanted to. I mean, that night at the fleshing floor, they could have changed their status from being single to now in a relationship on their Facebook page. But he chose to wait to go through God's way, which is pretty cool, pretty hard. So the challenge for us, the example for us as Boaz, is do we as a faith community, do we as individuals... Follow Jesus. Follow God's way for our lives. 
even when it's uncomfortable, even when there's a dream right there, it's so close, do we back off and say we're going to follow God's way? Boaz's loyalty to God influenced his actions. Does our loyalty for God influence our actions today? Are you and me applying God's ways for our lives with spiritual integrity? Our regular obedience to God is that pathway, that key for the Christian life. Obedience is so important. The opportunity had already opened for them earlier in the book. We see in Acts chapter 2, in Act 2, um, that they had already shared a, a meeting. She had arrived in Bethlehem. She was a woman with no job, didn't have any cousins. Uh, she could have gone out and stolen money. She could have um, become a prostitute, done illegal work. But she decided to follow God's ways for her life, to humbly follow God's way of doing gleaning. And so she went off and she gleaned in the fields. And uh, by obeying God, she puts herself in the place where she meets Boaz. If she hadn't ob obeyed God, she wouldn't have met this amazing guy. And also, Boaz was a business guy who followed God's words. He could have said, I don't want gleaning in my field. And Ruth says in chapter 2, verse 7, please let me glean. But Boaz lets her glean because he's a godly man. His employers that day let her glean the whole day. Why would they let her glean? Because he realized, they realized that their boss was a guy that followed God's ways and they wouldn't get in trouble. So she spent the whole day there gleaning. And because both of them followed God's way for their life, they met each other. He as a businessman followed God's way. Her as a person in a hard situation followed God's way and they met each other, which is pretty cool, pretty special. So, in our Christian life, one of the keys is actually obedience. When we obey God, there's this beautiful dynamics that's going on. Now, Jackie's not here today, but I thought I'd bring a tennis racket. So, I was going to ask Jackie, but she's not here. In tennis, the best way to hit the ball is not on the handle, although probably Jackie could still beat me by hitting on the handle. You could probably hit the ball here if you wanted to, or here. The best place for the tennis racket is here. And so I could probably hit this ball to Dan right now. But if I tried hitting it here, I probably couldn't. But I, you want me to try? Okay. It was Darren's fault. Oh, oh, Matt. Very good. Okay, there you go. Very good. Darren got it. But if I try to do it on the handle or on the head of the racket, it wouldn't really work. Our God is a powerful, loving God. If we put our life in the sweet spot, God can use us amazingly. If we muck around trying to manipulate, do things our own way, do little trick shots, it won't work as well for us. So, what I'm not saying is I'm not saying if we obey God, everything will go for us 100%. That we'll have health and wealth and life will be peachy. And if you count to three, you'll have a Porsche. One, two, Porsche. Okay? No. When we follow God, it's also, it becomes difficult sometimes. It's not a guarantee for a Porsche. But it is a guarantee to be where God wants us to be, which is really important. For example, Joseph, right? A man of God. He followed God's ways. He didn't commit adultery with his boss's wife. But it didn't go well for him. He got accused, falsely accused, and went off to prison for many years. But even in prison, this is where God wanted him to be for the next stage of his life. His obedience was important. So, when we obey God doesn't mean that you're, everything's going to go well for us. I'm not saying that. But when we obey God, there is this beautiful opportunity that God will put us in an amazing place for him. So, I have a reflection question for you. And you can take 10 seconds to think about this. What situation do you face this week at work, at home, in your relationships, where you need to make a decision for God to be in God's sweet spot? Just take 10 seconds. What situation... Do you need to put yourself in a place of obedience for God? So, Ruth and Boaz were willing to follow God and be dedicated to God's way. Boaz is going to demonstrate spiritual obedience. By going to the gate, there's spiritual obedience. And that's the kind of thing that we need, spiritual obedience. Now, you also see in verse 1 there... And in behold, here in the text, it points us to the relationship between obeying God and the providence of God. 
Boaz did a spiritual part of being spiritual obedience. He went to the gate, and God did his part of, behold, the Redeemer was there. The Redeemer just so happened to be there. Now, this is the second time in this book that we see this interlude happening. The first time is in Ruth chapter 2, verse 4, when she goes out to that field, just that right field. Behold, she was in that right field. In Ruth 4.1, if you've got the NIV and Bible in front of you, it, it doesn't have that word, uh, and behold, because it breaks the flow of the sentence. And the NIV likes to try and have the flow of the sentence, and I understand that and I appreciate that. But actually, the purpose here is actually to break the sentence and say, behold, look what's going on. Something special is going on. Look from Boaz's situation. Here is a divine appointment. It's not a coincidence. God is doing something. It's not just luck or happenstance. Um, it's not the world's order of things just happening to fl flow into place, but it's God's hand. And we also see that in chapter 2. Ruth, of all the fields that she could go to, of all the places that she go to, she just happened to go to Boaz's field. And so we see this time and time in Scripture. And as Christians, we call this the providence of God. This is where God's hand is being involved. God is actively related and involved in the creation that he created. And as Christians, we see this and we're encouraged by this. Now, the term providence of God is a traditional way of summarizing God's relationship with the world. Although the word providence and the word trinity, which we studied earlier, they don't appear in the scriptures in themselves, but the, but the, the term is backed up by scripture. You'll see it right from scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. You'll see the trinity God. You'll see the providential hand of God. As Pastor uh, Darren Bufshin said, the providence of God is, God is working using natural means in a natural world to achieve his ultimate divine plan. So he's using natural means, timing, people, seasons. In a natural world, we have time, seasons, people, to achieve his ultimate plan. God has a plan, and he can achieve it through that. Now, the providence of God is not a miracle, Okay. The providence of God is God's invisible hand at work in this world, in our lives. A miracle is the visible hand of God. Technically speaking, a miracle is when God stops the world, stops the natural processes happening, and then he, he supernaturally changes the normal things that are happening by his superpower. And so providence is not a miracle, technically. Providence is God's invisible hand. Miracles are God's visible hand. So we can see these um, divine appointments everywhere. Um, these would be something like, um, miracles would be like the parting of the Red Sea, walking through. Uh, Jesus turning wine into water. That doesn't normally happen. If you go to a wedding, wa water doesn't normally turn into wine. God stops the natural process and does something supernatural. Whereas the providence of God is God working behind the scenes. Now there's a New Testament passage that is one of the ones we go to for this. What is that New Testament verse that we often go to when we talk about the providence of God? You can. Sorry? Yes, correct. Perfect. Okay, Romans 8.28. You should know this verse off by heart. Come on, people. And we know that for, which is the, the reason, for those who love God, so those who love God, that's us, all things work together for good. So God is working for our good, for those who are called. Okay, the condition is that we love God, that we are uh, committed to following God's way. Then things work out for our good. Now, this is pretty hard to understand, but it's pretty cool. The classic evangelical writer, Wayne Grugan, who I like a lot, he makes some helpful comments about this. When we accept the biblical doctrine of providence, we're avoiding four common mistakes in our thinking about God and his relationship with the world. The biblical doctrine is not deism. Now, deism is where we say God made the world like a clock, wound it up, and then walked away. Providence means that God's actually involved in the world. It's not pantheism. We say, okay, God is actually part of the world. He's actually the world. No, God is separate from the world. God is not the world. God is not a tree. God is not the ground. But he's involved in the world. And also that providence is not teaching that things happen by chance or randomness or impersonal fate, that it's just... You're going to be born this way, and this is what's going to happen to you. And you're going to meet Boaz in the field. That's not fate. It's actually determined by a personal God, yet powerful creator. So you can break the problems of God down to three aspects. Uh, the perseverance, where God makes the earth continue to rotate, the sun, the rain comes. Uh, the conditions of it, 
going on, the involvement, and the governments. And so here in chapter 2 and 4, we see God highlighting the governance of his work in relationship. So God's purpose of life, his purpose of the story, he's going to be deeply involved and guide it going along. Now, there are hundreds of examples in, of providence in the Bible. Um, some of the classic ones are this. We see um, Abraham telling his son, God will provide a sacrifice. And of course, we see that beautiful picture where God does. In verse 12, And he said, which is God, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything for him, for now I see that you fear God. And so God, uh, so Abraham lifts up his eyes and look, and behold, that interruption there, behold, what do you see? There was a ram caught in the bush. Now, when we read this time and time again, time again, we see this is not a random act, but this is God's invisible hand in the life of someone who follows God, who obeys God. This is a visible hand, which is really cool. Another one is this um, that I like, is the um, providence of God with the baby Moses. He's in that basket going down the river, and the Pharaoh's daughter just happened to come out at the right time. She's looking amongst the bushes, not looking at the sky, looking at her iPhone. She looks down the bush, she sees the basket, tells her slaves, go give me the basket. She knows it's a Jewish boy. She has a heart for children, and she keeps the child alive. Her father's a wicked man who wants to kill all the Jewish people, but her heart is, is, is a heart of love. And so God chooses a heart of love at the right place at the right time, and the nation... And all of humanity is saved because this baby is kept. And this is not a coincidence. This is God working in our life. The right timing, the right place, the right person. Now, I know some of you probably have your favorite uh, Bible verses where you talk about the providence of God. Does anyone have a favorite one they want to call out? In the Bible, what's one of your favorite stories of the providence of God? Esther. Wonderful story. Providence of God. That's a good one. What else? Daniel, yep, great one. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Yep, yep. I guess the other one I would probably I like is the one where Jesus is born, right? Jesus is born, where's going to have to be born? Bethlehem, right? Where is Jesus when they, when, when, they, when they conceive, when the Holy Spirit conceives? They're down like 100 Ks down in the wrong location. An evil king decides to make what? A decree that everyone should go back to their hometown. So... Joseph and Mary go back to their hometown. She's pregnant, right? Babies come within nine months. At the right time, to the right person, she is in the right location, Bethlehem, to have a baby because an evil king. And you can just see the hand of God controlling the story, bringing us, bringing us to Jesus. And of course, he wasn't born in Bethlehem. Jesus wouldn't be the son of God. He had to be born in Bethlehem. Now, just a note about fully understanding the province of God, right? It's not a little nice little neat box that you can put together and say, oh, I understand the province of God. Once you start to explore this idea, it starts to drive you crazy because you get to a point where you say, I don't completely understand it. And that's okay because we have a God who is powerful and big and way more than us. We are limited in our understanding. I mean, to think that God would use a wicked king, Herod, to make a decree at a certain time that a child would go to Bethlehem and the parents would have to go there with a pregnant lady. She's probably going, I don't want to go to Bethlehem. Let's just stay in Nazareth, my, our hometown. You know, they could have easily skipped. And then God puts it all together. And then you're trying to think about, you know, all, this, all the other stuff that's going on. It's kind of hard to put in that lovely little box. But it's in Scripture. And we can confidently see God's invisible hand. And it gives us encouragement. We might not fully understand it, but it encourages us. Because we have a God who loves us, who works in our life. We can be thankful for the food in our table, for the, the wife that we meet, the job that we have. We can, be, um, we can have our eyes open to see what God's doing today in New Zealand. What is God doing in Israel right now with this war? What, what's going on? God's doing something amazing. What's happening? And we can be encouraged to trust God with our own lives, which is cool. For those who've walked with God for a long time, and I'll look this way because you guys are all the senior people. If you walk for God, with a, you're okay. If you walk for God even for 10 minutes... You'll see this in your life. You'll see stuff and you go, wow, that was a coincidence. No, that was the hand of God. I just happened to be in this position when God met this person in my life. 
you might not see a miracle, a technical miracle in your life, but when you walk with God and you're in that sweet spot with God, you will see God's hand in your life, his faithful hand in your life. So what is the key to the province of God in our lives, to your life and my life? Well, Ruth and Boaz are the example for us. Now, it's not really technical. It's not like I'm going to give you five points or seven points how to work the providence of God in your life. It's not for the elite. It's not for those who are very spiritual. It's for anyone who follows God and who obeys God. It's simple as that. Obey God. Walk in God's ways, and you'll see God walk through you. You don't have to read Hebrew or Greek. You don't have to be the pastor. You don't have to be an elder. If You don't have to be 105 years old. You can be 10 years old or 30 or 40, single or married. If you obey God, you will see God work through your life, which is pretty cool. Now, sometimes we like the idea of having a dog, but we don't like the idea of doing all the work for a dog. And I think sometimes we like the idea of God working in my life and come to church and say, oh man, this is how I met my wife, or this is how I got my job. But sometimes we don't like the idea of actually obeying God. You know, Boaz could have said that night on the fleshing floor, let's just update our Facebook right now and say we're in a relationship. Now, he put a pause and he said, I'm going to follow God's ways. I'm going to follow God's ways. Sometimes they say, oh, I want to be in the worship team. But I don't want to get up an hour early on Sunday morning like Matt and turn up to practice with all those people. Sometimes we say, oh, I would love to go to that prayer meeting before church. But that's another half an hour of sleep I'd lose. So we sometimes we say we want to be in God's will, but really we don't want to be in God's will. Now, we're moving on. The next part here is the negotiation, spiritual wisdom. We see here that Boaz is actually a very wise man. He understands how people tick. And so rather than putting the whole deal before the other redeemer, he breaks it into two parts. The first part is the land. And the second part is obviously marrying Ruth. So he emphasizes these two key points so that A, he might get a chance to marry his beloved Ruth. And also, if he doesn't marry Ruth, then this redeemer will also look after her. Either way, it's a win-win situation for Ruth. So he presents a land option, and of course, the other guy says, of course I want to buy the land. That sounds exciting. More land, more real estate. But he calms down a little bit when, when Boaz explains the second part. Boaz explains that if you, if you do this, you also have to marry this girl and produce a child with this girl. And this lady is actually a Moabite. He repeats this word a few times. She is the spiritual enemy of God. She has a good character, and one of the things I found interesting, I didn't know before, and I should have known this. It's pretty simple. Boaz's mother. Who's Boaz's mother? Rahab the prostitute. He knew, don't look at the outside if she's Jewish. He knew, look for a heart who followed God. So he could see that this girl actually followed God, like his mother, Rahab the prostitute. He could see this lady, although she's a spiritual enemy, she had the characteristic of God. But he emphasized this so the other guy would realize this. And, of course, when these were put before the other guy, um, he decided, no, oh, I don't think this is a good idea. If he bought the land, say, for $100,000, I have no idea how much land was worth in those days, but $100,000, the son of Ruth would inherit the land. As soon as the son got old enough, that land would go to the son. And as 100000 he bought the land back, he would lose that money. So this guy would lose the son, and he would lose the land. He wouldn't be able to keep it to the day he died. So with these things being in mind, this guy takes a step back. And he says in verse 6, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right for yourself. I cannot redeem it. He doesn't say I'm not willing to. But he uses the stronger word, I cannot. Lest I impair. Now the word impair here means to ruin. In war, you ruin a city. Um, to destroy. He said, I will be ruined if I do this. Now, obviously, he's exaggerating. And scholars would say he's exaggerating. But obviously, his feelings are true. He's feeling like it's going to ruin him, but it wouldn't ruin him. And it reveals that he does not want to do this. He is reluctant. He spiritually rejects this idea. Now, he had a, a, a bunch of choices that he could have followed. He could have taken the land, the wife, and given a child. He could have taken the land, but then reneged on the deal and not taken Ruth, but Boaz had carefully put this before the elders, so he couldn't get away with it because he made it very clear that this is the obligation. He could have accepted the responsibility and then married 
uh, Naomi, the, the mother. And of course, she wouldn't be able to have a child at that age to so be safe. Or he could offer and do um, offer Boaz the opportunity to do the right thing. And of course, we see in verse 8, So then the Redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. He drew off his sandal and he gave it to Boaz. And so sadly, this guy, this unknown man called the friend, bypasses the opportunity to obey God, to follow God, and he missed the opportunity to be part of God's story. This amazing story. This son goes on to be King David about three generations later. So he could have probably lived and seen his son being the king. And then later on, who comes along? Jesus. So here he does. He spiritually rejects this responsibility, and he misses out big time. So one of the lessons we can take away from here is don't miss the opportunity in your life when God puts a responsibility before you. Take a hold of that responsibility. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. Jesus says this. Who wants to save his life will lose it. But who loses his life for me will find it. Often when we try and save our life, we lose it. Here this guy wants to save his life, his inheritance, his money, his name. And he does the opposite. He would have been famous. We would have had his name here. It would have told us the guy's name. Instead, it's Boaz that steps up. Instead, it's Boaz's son who becomes King David. It's his great, great, great son that becomes Jesus Christ. So what opportunities this week do you and me have to obey God? What opportunities that look like a sacrifice? Oh my gosh, being in the worship team, I'm going to lose an hour of sleep. What opportunities do we have this week to be involved in God's process? Sadly, he misses out. But the cool thing is, Boaz steps up. He takes the responsibility, and he honors God, and he becomes the redeemer, and he gets the sandal, and he doesn't reject God's responsibility. As Michael said last week, he gets the land and the wife package. I wonder what you do with an old sandal. What do you do with an old sandal that's stinking, that's got sweat and dust on it? And apparently, these are the kind of shape of sandals they had in those days. Do you hang it on the wall? You know, every time you get a contract, uh, here's my 15 contracts. Um, do you let your kids play with it? Do you put it in a box? Do you, I don't know what you do with these sandals. Imagine going home with one sandal. Oh, no, what have you done today? Oh, well, I've, I've rejected the opportunity to, to marry uh, God's uh, person. You know, what do you do with that sandal? Um, I mean, would that sandal be in heaven? I've got the sandal. I followed God, you know. Anyway, it's interesting. I'm a bit bizarre thinking about the sandal. Never mind. But fortunately, Boaz takes the sandal and he does the right thing. Moving to second uh, movement. Now we see the witnesses announce. There's a spiritual celebration. There's a wedding and it's a covenant. A, a marriage is not, a, is not an agreement. It's actually a covenant. I will do this for you forever. It's not like if you do this for me, I'll be nice to you. If you are wealthy, healthy and wise, I'll, I'll love you. No, it's in sickness and death to... to Whatever separates us, nothing will separate us. And it's done as a community, in front of a group of people. So a wedding is not something you do privately, but it's something you celebrate together, um, which is fantastic. I remember going to your wedding. It was a good wedding. It was a fabulous wedding. Did you enjoy your wedding? Good. They both said yes. It's excellent. So Boaz doesn't trick her. Um, Boaz marries her, and they have this lovely relationship, and a child comes along. And, of course, we know that child goes on to... Give birth to another child, another child, and then, of course, King David. And probably Ruth's age, she would have seen David, um, King David, because it's only like three generations. And on my wife's side, um, the grandparents have a great-grandson. And on, in my family, a couple of generations ago, we had all four members living at the same time. So Ruth probably saw her, her great-grandson, um, King David, which is pretty cool. But let's zoom out a little bit. Let's zoom out for what's going on here. There's another picture going on. And I talked about this the first time when we were in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is about this lady, but it's also an illustration of what God's doing in our life too, through the person of Jesus Christ. We see that Boaz is an illustration of Jesus. Boaz obeys the law and redeems Ruth. Jesus obeys the law and redeems humanity. Jesus, uh, Boaz pays a price for the redemption. I don't know how much, maybe 100000 Jesus pays a price for our redemption. He dies on a cross. It's a huge price. It's way more than money. Boaz took Ruth as his bride. Jesus takes the church as his bride. Boaz loved Ruth. Jesus Christ loves the church. Ruth waited for Boaz to do his deal. She couldn't 
and be involved. She, she couldn't offer anything. She had nothing to offer. She was poor. She had no children. Believers wait for Jesus to do his work on the, on the cross. We are poor. We've got nothing to offer. We need to wait. Boaz accepted his responsibility under God. Jesus accepted his responsibility under God. Imagine if Jesus said, um, not my will, but yours be done. Imagine if he didn't say that. Imagine he said, I'm not going to take the responsibility for humanity. They're awful. But he did. So the question is this. What kind of rest did Ruth get? Well, obviously Ruth got a house, a husband, and uh, food. Back in chapter 1, verse 9, Naomi says to her two daughter-in-laws, go back, find a husband, find someone who's going to look after you, give you protection, give you a house, give you children. And in that culture in that day, that was really important. And that was the rest that they were seeking. And of course, in chapter 3, Naomi says, go to Boaz, get, get this rest. Get a husband, get the family. Family was so important for a Jewish family. For us, it's not so important, but in those days, it's absolutely important. And that rest will come by being in a family. The question is for us, what is our rest that we get as believers? We get a restored relationship with God. Ruth was a physical and protection and food and a loving relationship with Boaz in the house of Boaz. For us, we get spiritual protection, provision, spiritual food, a loving relationship with God, and we're in the house of God, which is so cool. Our spiritual condition is incredibly bad. Ruth's situation was Desperate for a woman in those society with no husband, no children was desperate. But our situation spiritually is even worse. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are desperate, far more desperate than Ruth. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But Romans 8.1, one, one of my favorite verses, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. So the story of Ruth is Boaz as a redeemer is so encouraging. And the story of the Bible is there is a redeemer for us, Jesus. And so as I close, we have a challenge. What is the story going to be like in our life? Are we going to go to the redeemer and accept his redemption in Jesus Christ and be in his family, find our protection, find our spiritual food? Or are we going to reject the, the offer of being a, of the redeemer in our life? Are we going to walk away from this amazing opportunity that we have in Jesus Christ? Now, the choice is ours. It's our story to write. It's our story to accept or to deny. The cool thing is the book of Ruth is our Redeemer office rest. Our Redeemer office rest today. We celebrate it with communion. Our Redeemer office rest. It's paid for. He has the ability to do it. He is the kingdom's Redeemer. He was born at Christmas time. He became one of us. He became one of our family. He has the ability. He has the authority. He followed the law. And we can choose to accept or not accept this. The worship team is going to come up now and lead us in our final song before I pray. And we're going to sing a really cool song, How Great the Love, which is an appropriate song because our Redeemer loves us. He is waiting for us at the gate for us to come. And it's a beautiful song. And it's a way we can respond to God uh, for our message today. So let me just pray as the worship team comes up. Father God, thank you that you love us, Lord. Thank you that you offer rest for us, Lord. I want to thank you that Jesus is our Redeemer, Lord. I thank you that he has paid the price from the cross for us. Lord, I thank you that we can enter his family, that this can be an amazing story of rest for us, Lord. We desperately need spiritual rest, Lord. We have no family. We have no ability um, in this world spiritually, Lord. And yet you are our Redeemer, Lord. You will take the responsibility, and you have. And you want to call us your children. I thank you that you love us. And all God's people said, Amen.